You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a set of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Cosmic New Year, Thoughts for the New Year 1920. Uh, it is volume 195 in the collected works. Lecture 1, given in Stuttgart, December 21st, 1919. Those of you who attended the last lectures held here will now understand that it is a demand of our time to let the so-called science of initiation, the true science of the spiritual life, flow into today's cultural development. I have also described what hindrances stand in the way of spiritual science, flowing into both the cultural life of the present and that of the future. Above all else, in the world today, there is what I have often characterized as the fear of spiritual knowledge. One only has to say this, and people nowadays pretend to be offended. For how, according to some people, at a time when we have come so wonderfully far, could people have any kind of fear of knowledge? Indeed, people today believe they are able to encompass nearly everything with their intellectual powers. But people are not generally conscious of this fear that I have often described. In their consciousness, people pretend that they are brave enough to receive every kind of knowledge, but deep in the unknown part of the soul, which today people basically don't want to acknowledge, there sits this unconscious fear. Because these people have this unconscious fear, there rise up in them all kinds of reasons that they claim to be logical objections against spiritual science. However, they are only emanations of the unconscious fear of the science of the spirit that reigns in human souls. For in the depths of the soul every human being really knows much more than is known intellectually. We do not want this knowledge, rooted in the depths of the soul life, to rise to consciousness because we are just afraid of it. Above all else, the human being divines this about the supersensible worlds. In everything we call thinking, in everything, in the world of thoughts, something of the supersensible world can be found. <clears throat> Even materialistically minded people of today cannot always rid themselves of the suspicion that something is indeed contained in the life of thought that points somehow to a supersensible world. But at the same time people also suspect something else about this world of thought that this thought life is related to actual reality, in the same way an image seen in a mirror is related to the reality being reflected. And just as the image in the mirror is actually nothing real, so the human being should also admit that the thought world is not a reality. In the moment that the human being had the courage, the fearlessness, to admit that the thought world is not real, the person would also be seized by a longing to know the spiritual world. For we surely would like to know what is actually real behind what we only see as a reflected image. But now I must point out that what I have just said has an important polar opposite. If by means of spiritual science we cross the threshold into the supersensible, then everything we experience here as sensible reality is transformed to a mere picture, an apparent image. Just as here on the earth the supersensible world is a mirror image, so is the earthly world only present as a mirror image in the supersensible world. If we speak out of the science of initiation, we must therefore, of course, speak of sensible reality only as pictures. When we speak this way, people feel that the world where they can stand so comfortably, breathe in so comfortably, see so comfortably without having to do anything about it except at most to open their eyes in the morning and to rub them a bit, is just turned into a picture. When people feel this, they begin to feel unsafe. 
They begin to feel about as unsafe as someone who has come to the edge of an abyss and is seized by dizziness and fear. On the one hand, a person would have to feel that thinking here in the sense world is merely a collection of images, and on the other, would have to feel, but gets over it because of the unconscious fear, that what tells of a supersensible world makes this world into an image. Now, of course, not everyone today can easily experience what someone who enters directly into the world of initiation has to go through. Those entering the world of initiation must not only recognize what all people today should strive to recognize, but they must also live in it. They must live in it the way one lives with one's body in the physical sense world. That means they must actually, so to speak, as a substitute, experience what one goes through in the physical sense world at the moment of death. They must become able to live in a world for which the physical sensory human being is not suited at all. Even when we only cut our finger a little, we feel a certain pain, an uncomfortable feeling. Why do we feel something uncomfortable when we cut our finger? Well, for the simple reason that the knife certainly cuts into the skin, muscle and nerve, but not into the supersensible etheric body. When the finger has not been cut, then our etheric body matches the uncut finger. When we have cut the finger but cannot cut the etheric body, then the etheric body no longer matches the cut finger and therefore the astral body feels pain. The pain comes from the mismatch with the physical corporeality. When the human being steps across the threshold of the supersensible world, then the physical body is no longer attached to all the other bodies. Then the person gradually feels in a larger way something like what is felt after a finger is cut. And this, my dear friends, this we must imagine the person feeling to an unlimited degree. Now, of course, one can hardly imagine what would come over people of the present day who are often so brave in their consciousness, often so woeful in their souls, if they were suddenly to be able to live in the supersensible world and if they had to endure all that comes from being unfitted for this supersensible world. Present-day humanity has come so far that they can comprehend everything related by those who know about the life in the supersensible, and this is an absolute necessity for the healthy human understanding of the present day. For only the knowledge of the supersensible can enlighten us about everything surrounding us today in such a chaotic and devastating way. Indeed, we live in a world where we must say about the things that appear and occur they cannot continue to be. They must undergo a transformation. But present-day humanity cannot at all see through what actually lives around them because one can only see in this way through the knowledge of initiation. One can only do it by being able, above all else, to compare the life of the present with all the influences that in the course of centuries, of millennia, have deeply affected the development of humanity. At a certain point in time, it had to be said publicly, the one fruitful impulse we need to bring into human life, which is beset by such destructive phenomena today, is none other than the three-folding of the social realm. By saying this, human souls were directed to the three basic streams of social life of the present time, the true cultural life, the political rights life, and the outer economic life. A great number of life's phenomena are encompassed within each one of these basic streams. Let us then allow these streams to briefly pass before our mind's eye, one after the other. Today we have a spiritual life in which the human being participates in various ways. One individual may only attend a public school based on his or her economic or legal life circumstances, while another may advance further in our institutions of learning. What people absorb in those places lives with us as part of our social life. This is what determines our relationship to our fellow human beings. Now is the time when one must bring, when one must in a profound way bring up the question, where then does this whole spiritual life come from? And how in the course of its development 
as it assumed the exact character it has today. If one traces back to the true origin of our spiritual life, then one must first pass through certain stations, so to speak. What prevails today in the life of our public schools, in the life of higher education, all harkens back to the distant past. I will omit the in-between stations. Usually one does not know where the public school system originated. For example, one does not realize that it goes back to what arose in ancient Greece. Basically, our spiritual life is nourished by impulses that lived in ancient Greece in a somewhat different form, which have only transformed themselves since then. But they also arose in the East and then had, several millennia ago to be sure, a different form than they already had in ancient Greece. In those days in the East, the impulses were mystery wisdom. If we leave out our political rights life, which is chaotically tangled up like a ball with the spiritual life, and leave out the economic life, if we separate out our spiritual life in an abstract way, then we can trace the way back thousands of years to certain mysteries of the East. In these mysteries there was something altogether alive, while the educational institutions of today have a lifeless character and teach only dry, prosaic abstractions. If we transport ourselves back in the spirit to those mysteries of the East, then we meet human beings presiding over these mysteries, whom we can describe as a kind of combination of priest and king, and at the same time, strange as it may sound to people today, of economist and manager. For in these mysteries, I want to call them mysteries of the light or of the spirit, an all-encompassing knowledge of life was practiced, a knowledge of life that was aimed both at investigating the being of the human being out of the world of the heavens and the stars and at regulating the lawful community life of people in the light of the above-gained knowledge. From these mystery centers, directions were given out to care for cattle, how to plant the fields, how to build canals and so forth. This initiation knowledge of ancient times had a powerful social impact. It filled the whole human being and was something that did not simply say nice things about what was good and true, but was in a position to control, organize and shape practical life out of the spirit. The path these leaders of the mysteries followed, and that as far as they could they showed to the people connected to these mysteries, was away from above downward. First, these leaders of the mysteries strove to reveal the spiritual worlds, and then they worked downward in that they concretely took hold of the spirit according to the basic principles of the atavistic art of clairvoyance. They worked down into the political life, to the political structuring of the social organisms, all the way to economics and commerce. That was wisdom with life impact. How did this wisdom actually come about in humanity? If we go back to the times when these mysteries were not yet authoritative, in the regions of civilized humanity there were many people with a certain primitive atavistic clairvoyance, people who, when they spoke of what they needed for their life, could depend on the impressions of their heart, their soul, their seeing. These people were spread out over the regions of today's India, Persia, Armenia, North Africa, Southern Europe, and so on. But one thing did not live in the souls of these people, what today we regard as our proudest soul capacity, intelligence or understanding. Understanding was not yet needed, so to speak, by the population of the then civilized world. For what is done through intelligence today was then done out of the people's soul inspirations and was led and guided by their leaders. But into just those regions there spread out what we could call another race, what we could call an entirely different kind of human being than the population of which we are speaking. In the sagas, myths, and in history as well, it is said that in very ancient times people came down from the highlands of Asia who brought a certain culture to the south and southwest. Spiritual science must determine what kind of people these were who came down to those people who received the directing force of their lives only out of their inspirations, 
from within. We find through spiritual science that these people who came into the civilization of that time like a new element of the population combined two things that the others did not have. The other people had atavistic clairvoyance without understanding, without intelligence. Those who came down also still had some clairvoyance, but at the same time they had the initial basis for intelligence and understanding. These are the first Aryans, as described by history, the first caste distinctions, at that time external, physical, empirical in nature, first arose from the antithetical relation between the old atavistically inclined souls and those whose soul forces were penetrated by understanding, distinctions that still have their after-effects in Asia, and about which Tagore speaks, for example. The most eminent of these incoming people, who had at the same time the old clairvoyance and the understanding and intelligence just then arising in humanity, became the leaders of those mysteries of the Eastern Light, and from them proceeded what later developed in Greece. So that sketching it out schematically, I can say to you, and then Steiner has a drawing here, it's a bit complicated to describe. From the East, the Spirit streamed forth. It was a living wisdom with a practical life impulse. In the course of time it came over to Greece, and we still perceive its after-effects in the earliest Greek culture. But in the progress of Greek culture it becomes, so to speak, filtered, thinned out as the bearers of the culture lose the old clairvoyance and the intellect takes its place ever more and more. As a result the culture bearers thereby lose their significance, because they are significant only because they are simultaneously endowed with both clairvoyance and intelligence. But in history it happens that something that was significant in ancient times lives on into a later time. And so in the cultural life of Greece, the people continue to live equipped, so to speak, with what was significant for that former time, when the leaders of the mysteries were like envoys of the gods. <clears throat> and so what formerly was a wisdom with impulsive strength was transformed into Greek logic and dialectic, into the Greek wisdom that has already been filtered down when compared with what was once its eastern source. At the time of that wisdom's eastern origin, one knew exactly why there were people who paid attention when the leaders gave their directions in the field of economics, but in Greece it had become a division into masters and slaves. The division between people still existed, but its deeper significance was gradually lost. The Greeks still had something of much greater significance that they at least knew came from the old mysteries, but that was filtered down even more on its way into our cultural life of recent times. For there, in our recent cultural life, it has become completely abstract. Today we deal in abstract knowledge and do not find a connection anymore between this abstract knowledge and outer life. This cultural current came through Greece and proceeded into our colleges, high schools and elementary schools and into the whole popular spiritual life of modern humanity. And today we can observe a peculiar phenomenon. Among the people who wander around us today we meet those whom we call the nobility or aristocrats. We endeavor in vain to find a reason why one is an aristocrat and the other is not, because the ability to recognize the difference between an aristocrat and a non-aristocrat has long been lost by humanity. The aristocrats were the leaders of the eastern mysteries of the light. And they could be this because from them emanated everything that had a real life impulse in the political and economic life. This wisdom has been filtered. The structure it had brought about among people had become an abstraction, without any sense for those standing within it. And from this abstraction arose what we call feudalism. In the outer social life this feudalism is tolerated, because also irritating those others for whom it makes no sense excuse me, perhaps also irritating those... Let me read that sentence again. In the outer social life, this feudalism is tolerated, perhaps also irritating those others for whom it makes no sense. One does not think anymore about its sense, because it is not found in the life of today, but in the chaos of the present time, the feudal origin of our abstract knowledge and learning is still quite apparent. When our contemporary spiritual life 
then became entirely a life of journalism, an expression was invented, truly a word monstrosity, that was intended to bring about a transformation of our life. But that has only become a description of our completely ratchetic spiritual life. Quote, spiritual aristocracy, unquote. Ratchetic is R-A-C-H-I-T-I-C. Spiritual aristocracy? If someone wanted to explain what is actually meant by that, then one could only say, it is what used to have strong impact in all areas of practical life in the Eastern mysteries, which made sense then, but is now totally squeezed out and has no sense whatever today. If one wanted to make a picture of our spiritual life now, then one would have to draw a tangled-up ball of wool down there where the three threads are so tangled up together. It is our essential task to disentangle this ball, and for that we turn our soul's attention to the second cultural stream. This second stream has a different origin, which also lies far back in the evolution of humanity, but which originates in the actual being of the mysteries, namely in the mysteries of Egypt. Having called the Eastern mysteries the mysteries of the light, I would like to call these the mysteries of the human being. These mysteries attempted, above all else, to gain the wisdom from their Egyptian origin that gives the capacity to bring structure into human community life, to formulate a basis for the relationship of people to one another. But this mystery stream then spread out and up through southern Europe, just as the other one did through Greece, and found its way through to the Romans, a people lacking in fantasy. I would like to call it the stream of the law. Everything that in the course of human development has gradually been cultivated as jurisprudence, as determination of rights, that is the filtered knowledge, the filtered perception of these mysteries of the human being. The second thread within our cultural ball has reached all the way to us, but very, very changed, very metamorphosed, having passed through Rome and its absence of fantasy. We cannot understand contemporary life if we do not see that so far human beings have remained unfruitful for the life of the spirit and the life of rights. If we do not see that humanity received the spiritual life after it had made the long journey to us from the Eastern mysteries through Greece and the rights life after it made the long journey to us from the mysteries of Egypt by way of Rome. One could point to many phenomena that would be proof of contemporary humanity's unfruitfulness. But we need only look at the path taken by Christianity. When it was time for Christianity to appear upon the earth, where did Christ Jesus have to appear, so that what he had to give to the world would find a way? He had to appear in the East. He had to place what he had to give to humanity into what lived in the East. The mystery of Golgotha is a fact. What people know about it is still developing. What was said about the mystery of Golgotha was clothed initially in everything that still remained from the mysteries of the East. The mystery of Golgotha was surrounded by the knowledge and wisdom of the Eastern mysteries, and people attempted to understand it with this wisdom. That is about how we still find Christianity at the time of the Greek church teachers. One can also point to still another phenomenon, When the completely spiritual, barren Western culture sought for spiritual refreshment in the person of one of its representatives, what did it do? Some people from England and America got together and took the wisdom from the defeated and enslaved folk of India. That is, they recently went over to the East to search for what had remained as a last remnant of that spiritual stream. Hence, it was theosophy, with an Anglo-American coloring, which wanted to draw from this source, but in its current condition. It is the barren state of contemporary spiritual life that stands out most strongly just in the Western countries. And the second stream is the one that has a political legal character, which went through Rome and is the origin of our life of political rights. This stream only flowed into our legal system through a side branch, and continues to work in it, so that in many ways what flowed into our culture in the form of spiritual life was received in a roundabout way 
from the Roman ju- political ju- juridical system. Even Christianity, which spread itself out in the West under Roman influence, took on the form that was determined by it. <clears throat> what then has become of the religious element as a result of passing through the t- transition point of Rome? It has become the great jurisprudence called the Roman Catholic religion. There, God, with his lesser gods, is altogether a being who rules according to Roman legal concepts only in the supersensible world. The concepts of sin and guilt are stuck in there, which are actually judicial judicial concepts that were not contained in the mysteries of the East or in the Greek view of life. These are judicial concepts of the Romans. It is a religious stream totally tied up in legalisms. Everything that is expressed in life can also take on a beautiful form. And so when we see this judicial political scene with the world God become a world judge and the whole of world development finalized by a judicial act, beautifully glorified by the paintings of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, it is the glorious expression of a Christianity tied up in legalisms, a legalistically tied up Christianity that finds its crowning moment in the last judgment. We must unravel the tangled up ball of our spiritual life and political and rights life in order to see what is contained in it, because being in it we live in a cultural chaos. These streams have their influence on us and we must disentangle them. But yet a third stream has flowed into our cultural tangle, which took its origin more from the north and which up to now has been primarily preserved, also filtered, but in another direction, in the Anglo-American social organization. I would like to call this the mysteries of the North or the mysteries of the Earth. What developed first of all as primitive spirituality from the mysteries of the East, excuse me, from the mysteries of the Earth, is a different way than that taken by the spiritual element in the East. Let me read that again. What developed first of all as primitive spirituality from the mysteries of the earth is a different way than that taken by the spiritual element in the East. There it took the way from above to below, first revealing itself as the mysteries of the heavens and the light, then carried down into the political and economic sphere. Here in the north things developed out of the economy. This origin has, to be sure, disappeared from outer life, At best it can still be noticed in some old remnants that have still survived. Take, for example, such customs that are still described when speaking of the old northern culture of which England is a part. There, at a certain time of year, you find processions going through the villages with a crowned bull, whose task it will be to fructify the cows. In this a longing for the spiritual life was brought out from below to above. There everything, even what was there of primitive spirituality, was based on the economic life, and all festivals originally expressed something of the purpose of the economic life. Just as in the Eastern culture the way was made from above to below, so must the way here in the North be made from below to above. Humanity must be raised up from below, from the economy, up through the life of rites, into the mysteries of the Spirit. But you see... This way from below to above has still not progressed very far. If we examine the way the judicial life has developed in the Western countries, we find it is entirely oriented according to Rome. If we examine the spiritual life, we often find it, not as obviously, characterized by its Eastern origin, as in the Indian theosophy I spoke of earlier. However, we do find what is contained there as original spiritual life, which was not imported from the East or legalistically from Rome, trying hard to separate itself out of the economic life. Let us take a characteristic case. We can only understand such philosophers, such investigators of nature as Newton, Darwin, Mill, Spencer and Hume, when we see how they developed above and beyond the economic life, how they tried to find the way upward. For example, we can only understand Mill as a national economist if we explain him as being beyond the economic fundamentals that surrounded him. We can only understand the English philosophers if we explain them as being above these economic fundamentals as well. 
This is something attached to the third stream, the stream of the mysteries of the earth, which streams from below upward and which still quite inexplicably has woven itself into our modern civilized life as the third thread in our ball. There you have the three threads that live in our so-called civilized life chaotically woven together in a ball. In a certain way, people have always risen up against this, least of all in the West. There and in America, the economic life that came from the mysteries of the North was embraced, and on this were built theories that were foreign to and devoid of the spirit, though built scientifically. The juristic political rights life was taken up via the roundabout way through Rome and the spiritual life element from the East. In Middle Europe, resistance rose up against this from many quarters. There, in many ways, people strove to apprehend these things in their purity, most intensively in the spiritual life that I would like to call Goetheanism. Goethe, who wanted to eliminate jurisprudence from natural science, is characteristic of the uprising against the merely Eastern spiritual life. Because just as in Christianity we also have jurisprudence in natural science, we speak of laws of nature. Those from the East did not speak of laws of nature, but of the rule of the cosmic will. <clears throat> laws of nature only arose when the Roman side stream was taken up. There the judicial law crept in through a window into the perception of nature and became law of nature. Goethe wanted to grasp hold of the pure appearance, the pure fact, the pure phenomenon, the archetypal phenomenon. Unless we cleanse our natural science from the appendages of jurisprudence, we will not achieve a cleansed spiritual life. Therefore spiritual science everywhere takes hold of facts and only points out laws as secondary phenomena. Then we also find a certain opposition to the Roman legal system, which is also found sticking in the heads of those oriented toward socialism. For instance, yes, even a Prussian minister of education in Wilhelm von Humboldt, when he wrote his beautiful essay on the limits of the state's activity, there lived in him something of the urge to thrust the cultural and economic life away from that of the state. Read the lovely little reclam booklet. I don't know what it costs today. It used to be available for a few pennies, titled Ideas Toward an Attempt to Determine the Limits of the Activity of the State. There, li there lives the urge to extract the legal political activities out of the other two. This uprising against the old lives in German philosophy as well. Excuse me, let me read that again. This uprising against the old lives in German philosophy as well. <clears throat> but health and healing can come into this cultural development of humanity only if we develop a healthy view of what the knowledge of initiation can give us concerning the origin of our cultural life. Particularly in Eastern Europe, perception takes place through the feelings, and there one always perceived the necessity of the three elements living together in our present cultural life. For of these three streams, what came from the West, excuse me, what came from the North, came to expression most characteristically in the West. There the economic life drowns out everything else. We can see the legal aspects particularly in Central Europe and we find a great deal of the mysteries of the East, of the light, in Eastern Europe and in Asia. There, where we still come across the caste system, we still find something of the idea of the old feudalism coming from the spirit. Life, penetrated by law, has bred the modern bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie comes from the legal stream. Today one must clearly see through these things. I would like to say, subconsciously, People have the urge to see through such things, but only spiritual science can bring real clarity to this urge, this longing. It always also showed itself in the nineteenth century, how people strove to arrive at ideals for the future through the intermingling of often unclear currents. One wanted to achieve this by not having people face one another abstractly. They do so today because the life of the spirit and the life of rights has been filtered and lives in us in an abstract way. And the economic life pants along behind to find the way from below upward. 
<clears throat> in Eastern Europe, where so many significant and devastating things are taking place, there this longing first showed itself when people tried to deal with this cultural entanglement by rising up against it. The Russian revolutionaries of the second and last third of the nineteenth century tried to fructify what had been left behind in the East and still contained a certain preliminary stage of the cultural life. They tried to fructify it with what appeared in Middle Europe as an uprising against what was handed down from olden times. And so in the letters exchanged by Russian revolutionaries of the second and last third of the nineteenth century, we see how they actually point out that already in Middle Europe the intellect, the purely excuse the pure, merely abstract life of reason had tried to penetrate itself with a certain spirituality. And ever and again amongst these Russian revolutionaries something arises that can be expressed thus. In German philosophy it was attempted to uplift the intellect, which had lost the old clairvoyance, to a certain spirituality once again. In the East one wanted to become intimately familiar with what had arisen in Middle Europe, and the intimacy was reflected in the way these revolutionaries wrote. They very much revered the philosopher Ivan Petrovich and spoke about how he had raised himself to purity of thought, how he had tried to bring the spirit once again into the dialectical thought games of the Western culture. And they tried to draw conclusions from this philosophy. In order to express more fully their feeling relationship to him, they call him not Hegel, the the Ivan Petrovich, excuse me, let me read that again, in order to express more fully their feeling relationship, feeling relationship to him, they call him not Hegel, quote, the Ivan Petrovich, unquote. Just in these efforts we see a preliminary ghostly vision, I would like to say, of what was later destined to become devastating. In our time there must be clarity over the whole earth. Therefore everything must be done to help this clarity achieve victory. But if the effort is made to come to this clarity, we must become aware of all we are up against today, the need of people to feel comfortable besides many other things. We must get out of the habit of considering people's need to feel comfortable, because humankind needs the spirit, and the victory of the spirit will not be achieved in the comfortable ways that are often taken today. For today the acceptance of the knowledge of initiation is fought with strange weapons. It was recently a great satisfaction to me when our dear friend Dr. Stein wrote to Dornach of how he had unhesitatingly put in his place an enemy of the human spiritual life here in the neighborhood. It was on an occasion that is quite significant indeed from a cultural historical aspect. For there it happened, and you will correct me if I am mistaken since I was not there myself, when one of our friends cited some saying from the Bible. The minister who was chairing the meeting did not like the truth of those sayings and maintained that here Christ was mistaken. Was that said? Agreement from the audience. When today someone does not know how to help themselves in these matters, then that person becomes infallible. But Christ is mistaken. We have come a long way. You see, all these things testify to the character of the truth of what is living as spiritual life through humanity today. The spiritual life can no longer remain in the sphere of truth when it has become entirely abstract. But one must perceive what is really happening here. The periodical titled The Threefold Social Organism recently gave an account of a meeting that was reported to have taken place here in Stuttgart at which both Roman Catholics and Protestants took issue with what is disseminated here as spiritual knowledge. The Dom Capitular was supposed to have said that a discussion was unnecessary because people could inform themselves about Rudolf Steiner's teachings from the opposing publications but the writings of Dr. Steiner were not to be read because the Pope had forbidden it. In fact, this is the latest instruction from the Jesuits of the Congregation of the Holy See that applies primarily to Catholics, that Catholics are forbidden to read writings about anthroposophy. Therefore, today, Roman Catholics are required to inform themselves about what I teach from the writings of the opponents, from the writings of Siling and some others, because my writings are forbidden by the Holy See. Against this, if one knows the whole attitude of the Roman Catholic Church and knows how the individual 
integrated the way he or she is is only a representative of the whole organization, one must raise in all seriousness the question in one's deepest soul, how can such a proceeding be in any way at all reconciled with human morality? Is it not deeply unethical? Today we must not hesitate to ask such questions. We now live in a very serious time and cannot afford to continue sleeping on in an easy, comfortable, and lazy way. We must without reservation really bring those things that can bring about healing to expression, while at the same time throwing the necessary light on the immorality of the untruthfulness of the present time. And when we come right down to it, this untruthfulness has been spread to no small extent. Recently Dr. Boos brought me an essay by a doctor of sociology. It began approximately with the following words. What a way it is from the clear thoughts of Waxweiler to the obscure thoughts of Rudolf Steiner. But, the author continues, this gentleman was also the intimate of Wilhelm II, and it is said that just in the last years he stood by Wilhelm II with important counsels, so that one can call him the Rasputin of Wilhelm II. Quote, we do not want to be the one to spread this rumor, unquote, it says in the following sentence. There you can learn two things. First, the moral degradation of such a person who makes himself the bearer of this rumor and his wonderful logic when he says that in spreading this rumor before his readers he is not the spreader of this rumor. Many people think like this today, abandoned by all the spirits of reality. What they say is already far beyond any reality. For I cannot say, I say something in that I don't say it. For Monsieur Ferrier, who wrote this, creates that kind of a model of the human being. One cannot have anything to do with such morally depraved individuals. I could only determine, and I hope it will be thro thrown in his face, that I had the following connections with Wilhelm II. First, I once sat in a theater in Berlin, perhaps in the year 1897, upstairs, in the first row, and in the middle of the theater, Wilhelm II sat in the royal box, and I saw him at a distance of about from here to the end of this hall. The second time I saw him was when he walked behind the coffin of the Grand Duchess of Weimar, quite a long way off. The third time was in the Friedrichstrasse in Berlin, when he rode through the streets with his retinue, his marshal's staff in his hand, and the people were shouting hurrah. These were all my connections to Wilhelm II. I have not had or sought any others. In this way today, Assertions are made, and some of what you read, fixed on the paper with black printer's ink, is not worth any more than this dirty rumor, which is used today to make a heresy of anthroposophy in the Catholic countries. Today one must go to the source of things. Today it is not enough just to accept the things that are said, but it is necessary that people accustom themselves to going to the source of what is said and asserted but the capacity to recognize the true origin of the outer factual world will only come to bloom for humanity out of a deepening into real spiritual knowledge. The end of Lecture 1